morning. us this morning. Greet one another. Tell them you're happy to see them here at Family Worship Center. You see someone you don't know, go shake their hands, introduce yourself. And go say hi to this beautiful baby over here, Lyric.
For we know the truth, your truth has set us free. In your name alone, we have been released. You are here with us. You are here with us. We are slaves no more. Freedom is our hope. Never looking back, Jesus, you are Lord. And we give all to you. Yes, we give all to you. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, chains are broken. Eyes are open, Christ is with us. Christ is with us. He's in this place this morning. Oh Lord, we cry out to you. Who the Son has freed, He is free indeed. All our sin is gone. Cause we have been redeemed Cause Jesus paid it all Yes, he did And Jesus paid it all Heard the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is Chains are broken Eyes are gates of heaven fill our hearts as we surrender Lord let your presence fall Lord let your presence fall open wide the gates of heaven we will worship you forever Lord let your presence fall Lord let your presence fall open wide the gates of heaven fill our hearts as we surrender Lord let your presence fall Lord let your presence fall open wide the gates of heaven we will worship you We like to say that you are welcome here, God. But you can have an, an open sign on a building and never enter into it. And there's something about entering into the presence of God that does break all those chains. And you know what? Let me take it a step further. Rather than just breaking it, it destroys those chains that hold you down. Where they can't be picked up again. I'm just asking you to open that door. He is here. 
but open that door and enter into his presence. Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Matchless love and beauty, endless worth. For nothing in this world can satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence is heaven to me. Yes, it is. Your presence is heaven to me. Treasure of my heart and of my soul. In my weakness, you are merciful. Redeemer of my past and present wrong. Holder of my future days to come. Your prayer. Cause Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. For nothing in this world can satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry.
Have you ever tasted something and said, this is just like heaven? It's kind of like you can get lost. It's like you get overwhelmed because you, you didn't expect it to be that good. You know, you kind of just like, you just have to have a moment. And if you haven't had that dessert, I'm sorry. But that, you know, maybe it's a food. Maybe it's a place. Maybe it's something. Mom's food. You go off for a long time and then you finally come back and she makes your favorite meal and you just go there and you say, oh, it's like heaven. When's the last time we felt that in the presence of Jesus? When is the last time that we have sat in his presence and said, you know what? I've missed this. I haven't felt this free in a long time. I've missed this. I haven't had a time where I didn't worry about stuff in a long time. I missed this. I have not ever felt so overwhelmed. I have not ever felt like my answers could be found today. I missed this. It's that opening of that door and just entering in. He is in this place. He is here with us. So the invitation, we've, we know he's here. He sent out an invitation to us today. He's made an appointment with us today and said, you want that feeling? Just let go and call out to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ever ask or imagine. And feel that heaven this morning. Lord, we want that moment right now. That in the moment of the storm, you become that peace. And you say, peace, be still, and it happens. We miss. We miss, Lord. That you would come into this place, Lord, and that you would minister to each heart, each mind, each life, each situation. Each trouble, Lord, whatever would trouble their minds, their hearts, their souls. Lord, that we would give it all to you, Lord, and that you would sustain us and you would provide for us and you would give us, give us the answers that we need this morning. Do that in the name of Jesus. We call out the name of Jesus. We surrender to the name of Jesus. That he would do that work in our lives. Oh, Lord, we worship you. We glorify your name, Lord. Jesus, worthy. Your presence is heaven to me. When, before you're seated today, I want you to tell someone. When you say he, we're talking about the almighty God. But say he. Hey, we're in an incredible series right now called Hashtag Jesus. How many of you have enjoyed this? Hey, if you have not, um, if, you've, if you've missed something, you can actually go online, and I, I believe we're caught up right now. And I would encourage you to go back and watch these because we're talking about the very attributes of who Jesus is. And it has been such an incredible series as we just unpack Scripture. Um, I want to open up today just, just in a word of prayer. We're going to invite His presence into this place in such an incredible way. Last Sunday, we left on such a high note. Amen. I'm going to tell you, 
God met some people in this altar, and we, we were from wall to wall with people in this altar just seeking the peace of God, needing that miracle in their life. And, and afterwards, talking with just people about what God was doing in their life, just it just set me on fire for the entire week. And uh, we want to continue in that presence, amen, just praying that God will change lives in the name of Jesus. Father, we love you. And Father, we give you all the praise, we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor. Because you alone are worthy of our praise. And Father, as we come in this place today, it is about change. Father, change us from the inside out. Make us new in you. It is all about you, and we want to honor you with everything we do, Lord God. So as we honor you, I pray that you'll open the floodgates of heaven, pour your Holy Spirit into us, and change us by the power of God. And Father, we're going to be very careful to say thank you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for change. Thank you for miracles. Thank you for favor and the blessing that you bestow upon us. And Father, we pray that as we dive into the word of God, just bless us. Bless us. Bless your word. And let us leave changed in the name of Jesus. As everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Well, I'm going to take you to our theme verse this morning. And our theme verse is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And it's in the message. And this is the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is, is talking. And as the Apostle Paul is talking, he is saying this. He says, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches or the latest philosophies. But this is what I love that the Apostle Paul said. He said, I deliberately kept it plain and simple. Can somebody say amen to plain and simple? Has anybody ever gone into a church and the preacher preached in such a way that you felt like he, you were 10 feet underneath what he was preaching and you walked out going, I don't know if I just came or if I just went to church. I don't know if I just understood one word that he said. Sometimes we go too deep. And the apostle Paul said, on purpose, I kept it plain and simple. That's what he said. First Jesus. Can somebody say Amen. First Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. So the apostle Paul, when he began to speak, he said, first, I will teach you Jesus and who he is. Then he said, and I'll teach you Jesus and what he did. And so we're picking up on that entire concept that we're just going to keep it plain and we're going to keep it simple. Amen? We're going to keep it where people can understand it. People can just take it, chew on it, digest it, and understand who Jesus is. Today, I'm going to take you to, to really my favorite verse. And if you've been in this church for very long at all, you've heard it 10,000 times before. Somebody tell me, where am I taking you? I don't know how you knew that. John 10.10. 10. I'm going to take you to John 10.10, 10, but I'm going to carry it on into 10.11 that I really never, ever bring up. And that's really going to be the key, the crutch of what we're going to be talking about today. Today, uh, from John 10.10 10 and 11, it says this. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it to the full. But Jesus goes on to say this in verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. See, of all the metaphors that Jesus used to describe himself, he uses the word shepherd to describe himself. Of all the metaphors he uses for the church and for his people that follow him, he says we're like sheep. Anybody ever raise sheep? I raise sheep, and they're not the smartest animals in the world. But they're interesting animals, and we're going to get into some of the things about that. But he says that we're a lot like sheep. Another metaphor he uses for the church is a family. See, this thing called church was never meant to be just this big institution. It was never meant to be this huge organization where you could not get plugged in. But the church was meant to be a family. It was meant to be a place where people could come in and could find relationships. I'm going to pause right now. I'm going to say something. Um, I got a phone call Wednesday afternoon, and uh, Selena, I'm just going to say it, okay? Selena called, and she had a need, and uh, it, was a, it was kind of a desperate need, and she said, we're, needing it. we're getting a U-Haul right now. This is Wednesday, not a couple of hours before church is starting. And she said, we're getting a U-Haul right now. We've got an emergency. This has got to be done. There was a lot of other details. And she said, I just need some help. And I said, uh, I can be there at 9 o'clock. But I've, I'll get through church and everything, and I will come. I don't know what can be done. I just threw it out to my class before I left on, uh, 
on Wednesday night and told the class what we were doing. These are people that's all got to get up and go to work the next day. They've all got jobs to go to. They've got kids to put in bed. And I just told them, I said, I'm going over here. This is the details. This is what I'm doing. And 11 people showed up to pack that house up. And we packed an hour and a half. Our people was there an hour and a half. And we completely packed an entire U-Haul full. And I stood back and I go, that's family. That is family. That's what this thing is about. When you have a need, you're not standing out there all by yourself. But when you have a need, you've got a family. And that's one of the metaphors that God uses for the body of Christ. As he says, it's a family. Another thing is he calls us a fellowship. We were never meant to do life alone. We were never meant to do life all by ourselves out in left field. But God brings us into a fellowship where we can have people that we can lean on in times of need, that, we can, that can be there to help us out whenever we're, we're in trouble. But he also calls us a body. And in 1 Corinthians 12, we, we talked about that not too long ago. And in 1 Corinthians, he, he refers to the, the body of Christ just like our physical body. Every one of us, we belong somewhere, and we're connected to something greater than who we are individually. Amen? And so of all the metaphors, but going off the text in John 10.10 10, and really John 10.11, he refers to us really that he is our shepherd, and when he refers to himself as being a shepherd, he refers to us really as being his flock or his sheep. Now, as we dove into this last week, the, the first week, and I want to encourage you, if you have not been here Week number one of this, hashtag best friend, Jesus is my best friend. If you did not get that, it really set the whole precedence for what this entire series is all about. And I would encourage you to go online and, and look that up. Follow us on Facebook. And it's got a link to, to get to our website. Pick up a business card in the back. It's got, a, it's got the, the QR yeah, QR code, almost went brain dead there. It's got the QR code in the back. You can snap that with your phone. It'll take you straight to our website, and you can listen to the sermon as you're, as you're driving down the road. But Jesus, hashtag best friend, we learned that before Jesus ever did anything, before he ever taught, before he ever preached a message, before he ever healed anyone, before he ever performed any miracle, before he ever cast a demon out of anybody, for 30 years of his life, Jesus just did life. He got up. He went to work. He had people that got mad at him. He just did life. The Word of God says he was tempted in every single way that we can be tempted. He was tempted in. And Jesus qualifies because of spending 30 years doing that before he ever did the miracles that we, that we study. For 30 years he did that. He qualifies to be our best friend. The scripture says, now he sits at the right hand of God, and at the right hand of God, he is now my advocate, that if I get in trouble, it's almost like he's sitting there saying, but God, God, it's okay, it's okay, I got this. I understand where he's at, because I've also lost a loved one. I understand where he's at, because I've also been sick with that. I also understand where he's at, because I've had that pain. I know where he's at. I've been tempted with everything that they've been tempted by, and I understand. And now he stands between God and us as our advocate, fighting for us. Hashtag, he's my best friend. Amen. Yeah. Then we moved on to the next week talking about a teacher. Hashtag teacher. Jesus not only is our best friend, that he came to, to identify in, in flesh who we are and what we go through. He also came to be the ultimate teacher in our life. And as that ultimate teacher in our life, he just didn't write a book and hand it to us and say, now obey it. As an example, he showed us through his life how to go through, how to, to conquer everything that we need to do by an example. Amen? Last week, man, did you enjoy last week? Last week was just such a powerful Sunday, but as we dove into last week, we talked about hashtag healer. Another attribute of God is he is our healer. But how many of us in the midst of a miracle that we're seeking, in the midst of a miracle that we don't, that, that, that we want, we don't get it exactly the way that God, we want God to do it. Or maybe we just go, God, you didn't even act on my behalf. And sometimes, sometimes when we talk about Jesus being our healer, maybe Jesus being our miracle worker, it could be one of those places in Scripture that that's where we get frustrated because we don't think God's moving. A lot of times when God's not moving, he's behind the scenes doing all kinds of things trying to get us to that next step. Because if he can fix some things here for us, he can promote us to that next place that he needs to take us. And, he, and really the miracle that I believe that most of us need is we need joy restored back into our life. We talked about that last week. 
The scripture says that it is the joy of the Lord that is my what? It is my strength. And when I get the joy of the Lord in me, man, it is, it is amazing what God will do to help me sustain and go to that next level. Well, today we're going to talk about hashtag shepherd. Amen? Hashtag shepherd. And that's your attribute of who Jesus is, who Jesus was, and who Jesus wants to be in our life. In Psalm 100 verse 3, it says this, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his we are his people. We are the sheep of his pastor. So we're going we're gonna to look at that, uh, that scripture. We're going to kind of break that down. And, and really what Jesus is, is talking about, what Jesus is, is really uh, trying to, to bring to the forefront of our mind is the idea that he wants to shepherd us. He wants to take care of us. And what is interesting about that word shepherd as you look back in the old original text, when you look at the word shepherd, shepherd is the closest word to the English word that we have, pastor. Pastor. So when you kind of break it down, Jesus is saying, not only do I want to be your shepherd, Jesus is saying, I want to be your pastor. That's what I want to be to you. Uh, scripture is, 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 is so clear with this. We all need a pastor, don't we? Uh, we all need a pastor. There's, there's times that, uh, that we go through things that are difficult in our life, and, and uh, when we go through a difficulty, we'll call who? We'll call our pastor, and we'll talk about the things that's going on. I'm about ready to go in the hospital, and I'm, I'm going through a surgery, and I need prayer. Who do I call? A lot of times you'll pick the phone up, and you'll call your, your pastor. There's times that you should need a pastor. Uh, when someone passes away in your family, <laughs> what's basically your first phone call? Your pastor says, I, I, I need something. I, I need that comfort. I need that help. I need, I need that. what you've got. You'll call a pastor. You're getting married. Woo-hoo. Who do you call? You call your pastor. We all need a pastor. Well, even your pastor has a pastor. There's a pastor that I sit with and I talk to all the time about any of the decisions, and it's my brother Galen, the great Copper Point Church in Albuquerque, but um, I just love my brother as my pastor, and my brother's always been there for me. He's been there for prayer. He's been there for guidance. He's been there to to just lead me when I didn't know what to do. When times were tough, he has been a shoulder to cry on, but he's also been that arm that lifts me up and encourages me. Everybody needs a pastor. It is a very important role. Every Wednesday morning, I meet with a group of pastors, just a group of pastors in this area. We meet. We encourage each other. We talk about church. We talk about things that we're going through, and I look at this group of men, these pastors, as, as not just my friends. I look at these guys as my pastors. Everybody needs a pastor. Well, there's, it, it, and it's a very important role. And, and Jesus is saying, not only I want to be your shepherd, I want to be your pastor. It's interesting, isn't it? I want to be there. I want to take care of you. There's, uh, there's one place in Scripture that I have found that it talks about the role of an earthly pastor, and it talks about the role of a heavenly pastor put together in one scripture verse, and I wanted to read that to you today, it is in 1 Peter 5, uh, 5, 2 and 4, through 4, and it says this, be shepherds, really I believe this is God talking to me, people that have been called into, into the area of pastoring, shepherding a, a flock, he says, be shepherds of God's flock that are under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, not eager to, to serve, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Then he changes from talking to an earthly pastor to talking about that heavenly pastor. And then it says, and when the chief shepherd comes. Say, I'm just an under shepherd. He is the he is the uh, the 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 Upper shepherd, can we call that upper shepherd and lower shepherd? He is the chief shepherd. It says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the clown of glory that will never fade away. I want to leave you with the idea today that Jesus wants to be your shepherd. Jesus wants to be hashtag your pastor, hashtag your shepherd. This is what Jesus wants. And I want to take you to probably one of the most famous scriptures now. As we, as we get into it, Psalm 23. And as we go to Psalm 23, I'm going to throw it up on the screen. And I want all of us to read this together. Okay? Do we have it? I don't think that's it. 
Of doing. Is it just one verse at a time or is it the whole thing? That's one verse at a time. Let, let's just go one verse at a time. How's that sound? Are you ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepareth a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Such a sweet verse. Now, as we dive into the attributes of Jesus, uh, the psalmist David, he doesn't just describe Jesus as a shepherd. He describes Jesus as my shepherd. It is something that he makes personal. It's my shepherd. It is a very personal thing as he dives into this. Now, I understand this because I'm married and I've now stepped into a relationship with Shannon almost 25 years now. Amen. She has put up with me for 25 years. Can somebody say that's a good woman? <laughs> and in this relationship with Shannon, she is a wife. Amen. But I don't refer to her as that, just a wife. Uh, even though she is, that's not how I refer to her. I don't refer to her as the wife, even though she is the wife, and I better not ever forget that. Amen, men? She is the wife, but I don't refer to her as the wife. She is my wife. And when I describe Shannon in such a way, it is with pride, it is with ownership, I say, she is my wife. That my makes that thing so personal in my life. I own her. <laughs> How do you like that one? I own that relationship. We now are one. It is intimate. So when I describe her, I say she is my wife. And the psalmist begins saying something so very personal. And if we miss that my in Scripture, we miss what David was really saying. David is saying, I have a relationship with my God. I have a relationship with my Lord. I have a relationship with the shepherd. I have a relationship with my pastor. I have a relationship with that person. See, David knew what it meant to be a shepherd. Before he was ever a king, David was tending sheep, his sheep in a pastor. When nobody knew that he was even around, when his brothers were off to war and taking care of all kinds of other things, David was taking care of sheep basically perfecting what it meant to be a shepherd. See, God knew that someday he was going to be the shepherd over an entire nation. And so God put him in the place to train him. And if, he, if you can just be faithful where God puts you, it's amazing where he will promote you. So he knew something about being a shepherd. And the whole goal of this series is I want you to leave here knowing today especially that Jesus is yours. Can somebody just make this? Jesus is mine. He's mine. He, I have made him my Lord. I have made him my Savior. And Jesus is mine. This thing called Christianity is personal. This God that I'm serving, it's not just some distant deity, but it is a personal relationship that I have with Jesus. It is, it is Jesus who is my best friend. It is Jesus who is my teacher, who trains me through all things. It is Jesus who is my healer. He is the miracle worker that brings a, pa a peace that passes all understanding. And he is not only that, he is the shepherd who takes care of me, and he is my pastor. That's who Jesus is, and that is my desire that when you walk out of here today and you leave this series, you know who Jesus is. Now, I'm going to take you uh, through six things that we find in Psalms 23. It's six things that tells us what a shepherd is and six things that tells us what a shepherd does and it describes the attribute of Jesus that I believe each and every one of us needs to know. And number one is this, the shepherd provides. Man, the shepherd provides. The psalmist began with the Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. When I was a little kid and we were learning this in Sunday school, they said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I remember sitting in the back of the room going, but I want him. What do you mean you don't want him? Why would you not? I never understood that I want him. I never knew it was the want. I thought it was I don't want him. And then so as a little kid, I sat there going, that's the oddest verse in the Bible. I don't understand why anybody would even, even teach that in children's church. And then it, one day you get to the point and you, have, you start growing up and you start kind of getting a little wiser in Scripture and start understanding. And all of a sudden you go, oh, the Lord is my shepherd. My is personal. And in that relationship, I shall not want. That want literally means I will lack nothing. You might want to write that out. I will lack nothing, which means that I will be taken care of. That's the bottom line. And that is where a lot of people will say, no, no, I think, I think you're wrong with that statement because I've gone through some really tough times in my life that I didn't feel like God was really taking care of me. Anybody ever been there? You don't have to raise your hand. You can just nod. I just felt like I went through a tough time and God wasn't there, so I'm not sure if he's really taking care of me. Well, listen to this. We all go through tough times. I've gone through tough times. I've gone through times where I didn't have a job. I've gone through times where finances were just absolutely rough. I've been through times where there was stress in the middle of relationships. And boy, how many know that anytime you have relationship stress, that can, that can just stress you out big time. It, I mean, we all go through things where, where they're just hard. But I'll tell you about those hard times. We were talked about this last week. Those hard times when God pulls me through have made me the man that I am today. Man, those tough times, and I don't want to go back and replay, re, re, replay any of them in my life. Not at all. But thank God they were there because I'm now, because of what I went through, I'll guarantee something, I'll treat Shannon different in so many different ways because of what I've experienced over here. And I came through victorious. I'm a better husband. I'm a better dad because of something that I went to. And I'll guarantee you one thing, I'm a better friend and I'm a lot better pastor because of some of the places that God has placed me that was not easy in my life. But it's those, e those non-easy places that God has taught me so much. Amen? This is what I know at the end of the day, though. And when I get through the experience, God has never let me down. You know, I've said this so many times before, and I'll say it again today to you, but if God never did one more miracle for me, if God never blessed me one more time, if favor never ever fell, me, fell on me again, my salvation would be more than enough because of what he saved me from and where he has taken me to. My God shall supply all of my needs. Amen? It is just an amazing thing. Philippians 4.19 is what I just quoted. My God. Again, what is it? It's personal. My God shall supply all of my needs. Supply all my needs. Not my wants. Yeah. Yeah. He supplies all of my needs. I, uh, I meant to grab it. I left it on my shelf in my office, and I meant to grab it this morning. But I was telling our congregation one time that one of my greatest desires in the whole wide world, it was back a long time ago, was I wanted a Hummer. They were big and manly and tough. And, man, I wanted a Hummer. And I thought, it'd be the greatest thing. That, that's a pastor's vehicle right there. I just need a Hummer. That's what I want. And uh, you know what's interesting? God supplied all of my need. I just didn't know it was going to be in a toy. <laughs> God's got a sense of humor, and he uses Bruce Long to bring it out sometimes, you know. But he, it doesn't say he's just going to give you everything you desire. Because that would create a spoiled, rotten brat, and we all know how spoiled, rotten brats are. We like to pass them down to somebody else in the nursery, you know? <laughs> but it says he will take care of all of our needs according to his, what? Glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Second thing is this. Not only does he provide this, the, the shepherd restores. And this is a big one. The shepherd restores. Anyone who has ever gone through a difficult situation knows that it just sucks the life out of you. Amen? Anybody ever had the life sucked out of them besides me? You look at a situation, you go, you life sucker. <laughs> look at that person that just used you, used you, used you, used you up, abused you, and threw you out of the trash, and you go, oh, why you, you life sucker. And sometimes it just sucks 
the absolute life out of us. Man, sometimes we go through situations as like getting our teeth kicked in. Sometimes we go through situations like getting kicked in the gut, and it just knocks all of the wind out of you. And David says this in the psalm. He makes me lie down. He makes me lie down. Have you ever had that kid that just would not go to sleep at night? Anybody ever had that child? It was really funny that this is in my notes, and our nursery worker, Kelsey Bullard, came in, and she said, I didn't go to sleep last night until 3 o'clock in the morning because Jakin was still up just doing everything at 2 o'clock. She said, I'd put him down, and he was up. I'd put him down, and he was up. I'd put him down, and he was up. Isn't it amazing that we look at these kids and we know they're wore out? We look at these kids and we know they're tired, but they'll just fight it and fight it and fight it. And what do we have to do? We have to make them lay down. David understood this as a shepherd himself and understanding his God. He makes a statement, he makes me to lie down. He makes me lie down. See, David is describing the exact same situation we have with our kids. I know there are a lot of people who are so tormented with bad decisions in their life that you don't know the peace of God. You've done something so horrendous in your past, you don't know if you can get over it. You don't even know if God can really forgive you. You don't know if there is a tomorrow of grace because of your life of the past of a disgrace. You don't know if God could ever forgive you for what you've gotten so addicted to that you can't get away from it. And you find in your life that there is no peace at all. And we go through life tormented because of things that we've done in our past that we can't get away from. What did I say a few weeks back? Objects in the rearview mirror are larger than they appear. You will never be able to steer our life forward if we keep looking in the rearview mirror because that's where the enemy wants to keep our focus of where we come from and not where he wants to take us. The cross before me, it is what it's about, keeping our eyes focused on what Jesus wants. And I believe there's so many people that are tormented because of bad decisions in their past that they can never find the peace of God. They can't find it. Does anybody remember the old hymn? And it was actually penned in 1873. And yes, I am going to sing it for you. Because my wife will not let me sing on the praise team, so I sing in my sermons. And it goes like this, and if you know it, sing it with me, okay? When peace like a river attaineth my way, when sorrows like sea billows row, whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say, that's the weakest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> it is well, it is well with my soul. Let me take you to where that story came from and when that was penned. Horatio Spanford lived, he uh, was born in 18, 1828. And he was a wealthy Chicago lawyer and also was involved in a lot of real estate. He had a thriving legal practice, a beautiful home, a wife, four daughters, and a son. And he was also a devout Christian and a faithful student of the Scripture. And his circle of influence were great evangelists like Dwight uh, L. Moody and Ira Shankly. And there were so many others that, that were his friends of the day. It was at the very high point of his financial and professional success that Horatio and his wife, Anna, suffered a tragic loss of their young son, and he died. And shortly thereafter, in October uh, 8 of 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed almost every real estate investment that Spanford had, including his business. In 1873, Spanford... Uh, scheduled a boat trip to England in order to give his wife and his daughters some much-needed rest and vacation and time to recover from the tragedy. And so he was sending his family over to join Moody and Shankly in, a, uh, in an evangelistic campaign through all out England. So Spanford sent his wife and his daughters ahead of him, and he remained in Chicago to take care of some unexpected last-minute business. And several days later, he received notice that his family's ship, the boat that they were on, encountered a collision in mid-sea, and it sank, and all four of his daughters drowned and died in the ocean, and only his wife was saved. With a heavy heart, Spanford boarded a boat, 
that would take him to his grieving wife, Anna, in England. And on the way, he talked the captain into stopping at the very spot where his four daughters lost their life and drowned. And as he looked over the bow of the ship into the dark waters, he wrote the song, It is well, it is well with my soul. Only the peace of God, only the peace of God allows you to be able to pin words like that at the most tragic loss in your entire life. It is only the peace of God that gives you the strength that you need to stand, to stand firm. And the testimony of, this, of, of his Christian faith, the testimony of the words that he's written have never been forgotten all of these years later. It is well, it is well with my soul. In John 14, 27, Jesus says this, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives, and do not let your hearts be what? Troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. This is what the world brings into your life is trouble, pain, heartache, and grief. And he says, and do not be afraid. And so David just tells us he makes us lie down in green pastures. What are these green pastures that David's talking about? I believe the green pastures may absolutely be the Word of God. I believe the green pastures are places that He wants us to lay down in His very presence and dwell upon the words that He has left us that bring encouragement. He wants us to lay down. When was the last time you sat on the, on the meadow, you sat on the hillside, you sat in the green place, and you just fed yourself? When was the last time? See, I think there's so many times that, uh, that we maybe just become obese Christians that we just go and listen, we just go listen, we just go listen. It's almost like fast food and we just get fatter and fatter and fatter, but there's no real meat that's going into us. And it says that he makes us lay down in green pastures. And I, I, I believe that pastures may very well be the word of God. He says, you need to sit and spend some quality time in my presence. You need to sit and send, spend some quality time just getting into the Word of God. There is instruction in the Word of God. There is hope in the Word of God. There is deliverance in the Word of God. There is something that you need, and if you never pick it up, you never digest it, you never take it in, you never live it out, you're never going to understand the principles of God. And it says that He makes His sheep lay down in green pastures. I think it's time that we lay down and feed ourselves. But it goes on to say, not only does he make us lay down in green pastures, it says that he leads me beside quiet waters. You know what I believe that quiet waters may very well be? It is our time of worship. Anybody ever gone to the mountains, take your long chair, set it up beside the stream, and just sit back and hear that water just running down, and it just calms everything down? I like to go to Red River and take my hammock and stick it up between two trees, pull the cap down over my eyes, sit on that hammock and just listen to the water, and it is just the most soothing thing. I believe that those, the, the quiet waters could very well be our time of worship. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you just meditated, just meditated in his presence? How about in your car when you're just driving? You think sometimes we just need to turn off the radio Sometimes we need to, in the house, turn off the news. Sometimes we need to turn off our husband, our wife, our kids, our boss, our work. Our, we just turn it off and just lose ourselves in his presence. Yeah. Anybody want to get lost this week? Because I'm fixing to tell you to get lost. <laughs> Can I tell you to get lost? Who wants to get lost in his presence? Somebody want to get lost in his presence? I'll tell you what. I've got some things here that I want to hand out to a couple of people that if you just want to get lost, Tish has put together an incredible worship CD, and you can just get lost in his presence. You want to get lost? Get lost. Get lost in his presence. Dwell in what he wants you to do. Just shut everything out and say, it's just about you, God. It's just about you. Billy, you want to get lost? You want to get lost in his presence? I'm not going to throw it at you because you're bigger than I am. <laughs> Be like a ninja star. Hit him right in the forehead. Oh, man. Can you hand that to her? Oh, there we go. But just get lost in his presence. Well, I'm kind of tricking you a little bit because everybody here is going to get one today. Everybody gets one. So I'm going to ask Tish, and, and can you help? Or, what's your name? 
Trish and Shannon. I looked at her and said, you, Trish, ah, Tisha, Trisha, we got too many T's in this church. Hey, but this is what I'm going to ask you to do this week. I'm going to encourage you to shut it off. I'm going to encourage you to shut it down. I'm going to encourage you to get away for just a moment. Maybe it's while you're driving to work. Maybe it's while you're, you're at your lunchtime and nobody's around. It may be just your quiet time in the morning. or your, You know, so many times I think that we think that our time alone with God is a, a little devotional that we get on the Internet, and it's a muffin and a cup of coffee, and we think that that's going to sustain us. What I think we've got to do is I think we've got to put the muffin aside maybe, put the coffee in another place, shut the TV off, shut everybody out, and just sit in his presence. Just sit in. So this is what we're going to do. Are you ready for this? I want you to get lost in his presence. And we've given you a tool to listen to. We've given you a tool that you can, that you can plug in, and you can just turn everything off, and it is just some worship. It is some great praise, and it is some great worship, and you can just absolutely get lost in his presence. And then what we're going to do next Sunday on Palm Sunday at 930, 930, I'm inviting every one of you to come back, come right here where you're sitting right now, and at 930, as an entire congregation, as an entire church, we're going to get lost together in his presence. We're going to put this CD on, and we're just going to get lost. Who knows? A miracle might happen. Who knows? God may show up and just come down and give you a great big smack right in the middle of what you need. And you may get lost in the middle of that kiss. Who knows? Something incredible may happen as a church body as we come together and we say, I don't want anything, I don't desire anything, but just to sit and to bask in your presence. And we're just going to give it 30 minutes. So I'm going to encourage you to come next Sunday, 930, be listening to this, be prepping yourself, get into his presence all week long. And when we come here next Sunday morning, we're going to have an incredible time of just soaking into his presence. And it is going to be incredible. Amen? Palm Sunday. It's going to be good. Then he goes on to say, and he restoreth my soul. See, that's what happens when we get into the word. That's what happens when we get into our worship of him. When we get lost in him, it says that then he's at a place where he can restore our soul. See, the root word for restore is rest. He makes me lay down because he wants me to rest. That restoration that we're talking about, that God wants to do in our life, literally means this. It means to return you back to a place of departure. He wants to take you back to the beginning. Say, if you'll start right here with me, I will take you through everything that you need. Number three, the shepherd leads. The shepherd leads. It says that he leadeth me in paths of righteousness. Simply put, this is what he does. He leads me down right paths. How many has been down those wrong paths? Anybody made that left turn and go, how did I end up in left field? How did I end up with this problem? How did I end up over here? Because we're not in the path that God wants us to take. But whenever we're making Jesus our shepherd, whenever we make Jesus our pastor, he's our overseer, he's looking over us, it says then he's able to lead us down right paths, not wrong paths, but right paths, and it says right paths of righteousness sake. It's the right path that he wants us to take us down. And what's really funny is that path, it has his name on it. How do I know? It says so, for his name sake. This path that I'm on, this is God's path. This is where God wants me. Some of you are saying, well, I don't know where God wants me. I don't know what God's will is for my life. I don't know if I'd recognize his voice if he screamed at me. I just, I don't know if I've ever heard God. And sometimes we, we get so busy walking down so many different paths in life that we can't find the path that God wants to take us down. That's why we're in the process of changing everything we're doing here at the church, and we're really calling it doing church differently. We, we don't want to do church as it's always been done. Because what we want more than anything else is for you to experience God in the most radical way ever. We want God to do something life-changing in you, life-changing for you, and life-changing through you. So the evidence of what God is doing here flows in over here to someone else. And that what God is doing to you begins to affect all those around you. We want you to be blessed. Absolutely blessed. So we're going to try to do church differently. 
We're, we're starting this thing. Really, it's our E26 dream team. And some of you have heard of the E26. We're still really trying to put it together. But E26 is on the periodic chart. It's iron. As iron, sh- iron sharpens iron. And it's what we are to do. We're to sharpen each other. But this dream team is literally finding your place. Where do you fit? Where do you function? What path can I go down that I can make a difference, that I can fit into the church, that I can involve in the church, but also that I can get involved in the community? I, I've just learned that whenever we get involved in other others, it is amazing what gets fixed here. Wow. It is amazing. Jesus said this about himself. I did not come to be served. Jesus said that about himself. He is the star breather. When he spoke, everything came into existence. And Jesus, when he clothed himself in skin, shows up on planet earth and he says, I didn't come to be served. I'm the teacher. Hashtag teacher. I came to show you how to serve. This is what we came to do. John 10, 35 says the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they'll never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from one from him because they don't recognize the stranger's voice. And what's really interesting about this is I heard a story one time about a pastor that was going to seminary to become a pastor. And he told all of his friends, he said, before I ever pastor a church, I'm going to go to Israel and I'm going to work with shepherds. I'm going to become a shepherd and I'm going to see what a shepherd's job really is and how a shepherd handles his flock. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to pastor a church just like a shepherd pastor. So he went over, over there and he said what was so interesting is that there was these green meadows that several different shepherds would bring all their sheep to. And he said there may be six or seven different shepherds that bring all their sheep to one field, and they'd be sitting there grazing, they'd be laying down, whatever they're doing, and all of a sudden one shepherd would get up, and he'd go, yo 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 And all of a sudden there was a group of sheep that would go, there's my master. And he wouldn't do anything but just yodel and begin to walk off. And this certain group of sheep that knew him would just begin to follow him out of the field. And he said, then another shepherd over here would go, yo, little. He would do his little yell. Probably didn't quite sound like that. <laughs> but he'd do his little yell. And then all these sheep would get up and they'd walk off and follow him. And so this guy is the shepherd. He said, do any of the sheep ever get mixed up and just follow you that belong to another shepherd? And he said, no. Because he said, the sheep get so accustomed to my voice that they know me and they will follow me without question. And when I get up and call, they just follow. But they won't follow a stranger. Why? Because they know the voice of their master. Isn't that incredible? So here's your nugget for the day. If you want to put this on Facebook, here's your little nugget. When you wonder why you can't hear God's voice during the trials... Just remember, the teacher is always quiet during the test. When you wonder why you can't hear God's voice during the trials, just remember, the teacher is always quiet during the test. Amen? The fourth one is this, the shepherd supports. He says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and and I've, I've been in that place that I felt like I was in the valley uh, and I didn't feel like anybody was with me, and I felt like it was a dark place. But he tells me when I'm in that place, the shepherd is there, even though I can't see him, that I don't have to fear no evil. I don't have to fear because he is with me. I may feel alone, but I'm not alone. The Apostle Paul picks up on this in 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 17. The Apostle Paul found himself in a place where there was no support for him whatsoever. He felt like everybody had deserted him completely. And this is what Paul says. No one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. But the Lord stood by my side and he gave me strength. Amen? The Lord gave me strength. Let me tell you this. When you're in the hospital and you just got the bad report, he's there. When you're in the mortuary and you had no desire to be there that morning when you woke up and you find yourself that afternoon, guess what? He's there. A few days later when you're standing at the gravesite and you're grieving, not understanding why, why, guess what? He's there. When you have to go to the court and you stand before the judge, guess what? He's there. When you're in your bed late at night and no one's around and you're crying your eyes out, 
guess what? He's there. When you feel all alone, the shepherd is there, and you don't have to fear no evil because he's there. Fifth one is this that we find out. The shepherd defends. I love this one. The shepherd defends. I want to throw this picture up. Some of you may know this. Some of you may not. But the scripture says, Thy rod and thy sta- my, the staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but I believe one of the biggest mis- misconceptions in the church is that, that the church is there to clobber you over the head every time you get out of line. <laughs> Anybody ever been in that church? Man, you, you, you goof up, and all of a sudden you are condemned and basically almost condemned to hell. I know a lot of people that... Uh, that uh, they believe that you can't come into a church until you're cleaned up. You better get your act together, then we will accept you. You better get your act together, then we will use you. You better get your act. Hey, let me tell you something. If your pastor can sit up here and preach to you with all my flaws, I will use you with all of your flaws anywhere in this church. Anywhere in this church. Because let me tell you something. Nobody on this stage that speaks to you is any better than anybody that comes in that church. All we are is we are sinners saved by grace. It is by the grace of God that I have the ability to stand here. It is by the grace of God that you have the ability to serve in the most incredible way and just show the love of Jesus to someone. We will use you. Up and then throw you. No, we will use you. We will use you for the glory of God. The rod was never meant for you. The church's misconception is we have just beat the hound out of everybody because they don't live up to our expectation, our Christianity expectation. And we just beat people up. The rod was never meant to you. The rod was meant for the wolves. You think about that. The rod was this stick that had a huge club on it, and he would carry a staff that had a hook that if they got in trouble... He could pull them back in. If they fell off of a ravine, he could reach down with that hook and he could lift them back up. That staff was for comfort and support and help. And that rod was only designed to beat the enemy off. So when you look at thy rod and thy staff, that's what brings comfort because it supports and it beats the enemy away. That's good, isn't it? So John 10, 11, let me take you back to John 10, 11, and John 10, 11 says this, the good shepherd, my pastor, my pastor, my shepherd, it's personal, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We saw that on Calvary, that he became the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He became the ultimate sacrifice that I could have salvation. He became the ultimate sacrifice that I can have life beyond this life, incredible life with him. And all I do is I claim it in the name of Jesus. But then he goes on and he says the oddest thing in the rest of this verse that you look at and you go, well, I don't get that one. It says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. (laughs) He prepares a table? Really? Really? We're talking about sheep and a, she- and a pastor, and we're talking about him taking care of us and a rod, and, and all of a sudden it says he prepares a table before me. You mean, you mean in the middle of battle he sets up a little table and puts a white tablecloth over it, and there's a little flower. It's got some crystal there and some nice silverware, and there's some muffins that come out, and, and, he, and, and he prepares a table before me in the middle of battle. What, what, what does that mean? I believe what he's saying is he's saying this. Hey, sit down, relax. I got this. He prepares it, that I can sit, I can relax, and he says, I'm just going to take care of you. I've got this. I've got this handled. I've got this taken care of. Let me give you an example. Do you know that this is taking place right now? All around us, this is taking place right now. As you sleep, as you go to bed, as you go to church, as you go to work, as you go to school, throw that picture up. As you go to school, as you go to work, they're saying, you sit back. They're saying, you relax. You take care of yourself. I've got this. I've got this. And these guys, give it up. Give it up for those men and women. Amen. Amen. 
Give it up for the men and women that sacrificed their lives to say, I will go to the front line so you can set in ease. I will go to the front line so you can go to work. I'll go to the front line so you can have freedom. Sit back, relax. We've got this handled. And that's exactly what he says is he says, I prepare a table for you in the presence of, of your enemies. I got this. You just sit back and relax. Sixth one is this. The shepherd blesses. The shepherd just blesses. Some of us have grown up in environments where we think God's mean. Some of us have grown up in environments where we think God is a withholder. I could remember thinking, uh, God, I don't think I'm worthy. And every Sunday when the altar call was given, I was in the altar giving my heart back to God because I was scared to death that I was never going to make it. I didn't understand the grace of God. I, I never understood it. I didn't understand the unconditional love of a Savior that gave himself that I could have eternal life. And I was just scared to death of my salvation. And it's like I couldn't wait. This, this is really funny. I couldn't wait as a kid to go to youth camp because I knew that every year at youth camp I was going to get saved and I'd be good for a month, you know. Anybody ever pray, Jesus, don't come till I get married because I just want that one night with my wife? <laughs> you know, I just, 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 just don't come until then. Let me, let me get saved. Let me get everything right. And just, just, then you can come after my honeymoon. Then you, then, then you can come. But, but there's so many misconceptions that we have that God is mean, that God is a withholder, that, that I'm not good enough, and, and we, just, we, we just long for something. The grace of God is the most incredible thing ever. Because when you understand God's unconditional love and you understand the grace that is being poured out on us and how to walk in that grace, you understand that God loves you. This is what it says in Psalms 23, 6. It says, surely goodness and mercy. Are those my angels? Goodness and mercy? And it says, that what do they do? They follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what that phrase, follow me, means? You might want to write this down because this is really cool. Follow me means it chases me down. Literally, it chases me down. Surely, goodness and mercy chases me down all the days of my life. Hebrews 10, 20 says this, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dear, Lord, the dear uh, from, from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good work. Every good work. He gives us everything we need for doing His will. And may His work in you, work in, and may He work in us what is pleasing to Him. We're going to have to shut this one down really quick because I'm having a hebity hebity hebity. That's all the thing going on. <laughs> pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So let me end with this, and I'm going to end with this. What is our response? What is our response? My favorite dog in the entire world was a long-haired chihuahua named Griffin. Where's Griffin? Everybody says the dog begins to look like its owner. And my favorite, my favorite dog was Griffin. That was an incredible little dog. I, I, I love, he's not like the two morons I have now. <laughs> and I loved, I called him my Griff Dog. And Griff Dog was, uh, he was a cuddler. And Griff Dog would, he would love to jump up your lap. And, and he, Griffin just, I, I, do you ever, has anybody had that dog that just completely understood English? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just talk to them and they, it's like they knew what you were saying. And, and Griffin was just, he was the greatest little dog. Don't you love that sideways grin? And I just, I just love that little dog. And, and uh, Griffin, I don't know how this got started, but Griffin slept in our bed. He, he, he literally slept in our bed with us. These two morons don't get a chance to even come down the hallway with us. <laughs> they have to stay completely in the other room because I think both of them are brain dead. I, I really do. But Griffin, and, and it was quite a feat to jump up on our bed because he was a little bitty dog. But every night when we get ready to go to bed, Griffin would run in and he'd jump up on the bed and Shannon would go in the bathroom to take her makeup off and everything and, and Gif, Griffin would be getting ready to settle down. And every night that I'd lay down with Griffin, I would say, Griff dog, come here and say goodnight to me. And he would come up and he would put his head right there on my chest and he would 
kind of looks sideways, kind of looking up at you, and I just scratch that belly, and I say, Griff Dog, you're a good dog. Griff Dog, you're a good dog. And I, I just love on Griff Dog just a little bit. And then I'd look at Griff Dog, and I'd say, okay, good night. And he understood the good night, and he'd leave, and he'd go down, and he'd settle down, and he'd get ready for his night's sleep at the end of the bed. Griffin knew his master. He knew my voice. And when I said, Griffin, come love on me, without hesitation, he knew my voice, he knew my wish, he knew my want, and without hesitation, that little griff dog would run up, <laughs> lay his head on my chest, and we would just have a moment of just me and him together. But he would only come because he knew my voice. Our response is this, know the shepherd. Know the shepherd. I want to leave you with that, know the shepherd. John 10, 14 says, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. As we close today with just a, just a word of prayer, and I leave you today, I hope this is a great insight of another attribute of what Jesus wants to be to us. He wants to be literally our shepherd and he wants to be our pastor. But this is the problem for so many of us. We don't know how to listen to the master. Why do we not know how to listen to the master? Because these friends that drag us in the wrong direction scream so much louder than the master's voice that we can't hear. The desires that I have of, of my past of bad decisions that keep pulling me back that direction, those things scream so much louder than my master. They get my attention. And so many times we don't even hear what God is calling us to do. We can't even feel the tug of God anymore because the pull on this world is so great. The Word of God tells me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And we've got to get a lot of that world out of us and get God into us if we're ever going to hear the Master's voice. Amen. As you stand with me as we close today, I'm going to close in a very simple way today. And I want every head bowed. I want, to, I want just as much reverence as we can have in this place for just a moment with nobody looking around. And I will not embarrass you. I will not call you out. I won't call you down in any way, form, or fashion. Okay? This is just between you and me and God. Nobody looking around. But if you're in this place today and you're saying, I don't know his voice. I don't know how to listen to his voice. I feel a little bit lost. If that's you and you're in this place and, and you want me to pray with you that you can hear the voice of God, if you want me to pray with you that, that the shepherd can be your shepherd where you can say it's personal, he's mine. And if you're in this place today and you say, I just want to receive him into my heart, I want to hear him, I want to know him. And if that's you, you're here today and that is your desire. With every head bowed, nobody looking around, it's just me. It's just me looking at you. If that's you, just real quick, I want you to raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Amen. I see it. 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 You can put, I see it. I can, you can put it back down. Anybody else? I want to make him mine. Keep your heads bowed for just a second. I just want to talk to you for just a moment. This is why we do what we do in church. It's for these moments right here where the Holy Spirit has spoke to you and you've responded and you've raised your hand. This is why I put in 15, 20 hours into a sermon preparing every week is that I can bring the Word of God to you in such a way that the Holy Spirit can speak and that you can hear through what I'm saying. It is my prayer that as I, as I prepare these things and put these things together, that God is going to do something incredible. And today you've walked into this place and you've responded to a word from the Word of God that was given. I'll guarantee this, you're not here by any accident. That tug that you're feeling on your life right now is the tug of God pulling at you, trying to call you back in. I'm going to encourage you to get lost in His presence, get lost in His Word, get lost in His worship, where you begin to hear Him like never before. But if you just raised your hand, I'll tell you what we're going to do first, is we're going to pray a prayer of salvation, just inviting Jesus Christ to come into our life. 
And if you prayed that prayer, we're all going to pray it together. I want you to pray it and mean it with everything that you've got. Give it to God. Give it to God. And we're going to help you because all of us are going to pray it together. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. And I am lost without you. I want you to be my shepherd. I want you to be my pastor. And I want you to be my Lord. So right now, I invite you into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my wrongdoing. And forgive me of those things that turn me away from you. I'm asking you into my life. And I'm asking you to be the Lord of my life. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, look at me right quick. If you just prayed that prayer, it doesn't matter if you raised your hand or you did not. If you just prayed that prayer, God came into your life and he just did something incredible in you. But I'm going to tell you guys, that's the first step. It is the first step. And we want to just say this to you. If you, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome home. Welcome home. But we're not going to send you out not knowing what you just did. Ken, would you raise your hand? Ken is right, going to be right down here in the front. If you prayed that prayer, we've got some next steps. We've got some literature we actually want to hand you to send you out with, some information, just what you need to do next. I want to encourage you to follow the Lord with water baptism if you have not. But Ken wants to guide you through the next steps of what you need to do, and it will be the most important part of your life. Amen? Amen. Uh, last week, we, we ended in a different way. For some reason, I feel like the Lord is wanting us to do something different today. And I know this is unusual in church. And I know if you're a visitor, I don't want to freak you out. And so just stick with us and please come back and check us out again. But we're going to end in some huddles of prayer, okay? And uh, this may be a little weird, but I'm just going to ask some people to get together. Get together in some huddles just real quick. Turn to somebody next to you and get with somebody right, right there with you. Hey, if you see someone that is a... Uh, is, is uh, new with us today, I want you to immediately go to them. Shannon, go to somebody that's new. Uh, hey, girls, I, I'm going to send you on a mission. You're going right back here, okay? Yeah, right back there. I'm going to send you right back there. I want to make sure that, that no one feels left out. I want to make sure that everybody's got somebody. Hey, I, I believe so strongly in the power of prayer. And uh, just agreeing with someone. And I just want to agree. I just want you to know that that person that's standing on the right side of you and that person that's standing on the left side of you, they want something good for you. I want you to pray for them like you have never prayed before. And we're going to pray for a blessing in the name of Jesus. Can we do that as we close today? Father, we love you. Father, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. And Father, we thank you for bringing everybody to this place today. And we thank you for those that have made a, made a response today that they say, I want to accept Jesus Christ in my life. But we also know that as we're standing here, that there are those that have hurts. There are those that have wants. There are those that, that go through some tough times. And Father, I want to pray that in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that no matter what it is that we're going through, a tough situation, a hard time, that in the name of Jesus, that you will intervene into this circumstance of this situation. I'm going to pray that your Holy Spirit will begin to do a work like only you can do. And this is what we're going to claim. We're going to claim healing in the name of Jesus. We're going to claim for miracles to take place in the name of Jesus. Father, I'm going to pray that, that relationships will be restored, that hurts will go away, that pain will diminish in the name of Jesus, that you will be involved in what is taking place, that there is a peace that comes over us in the name of Jesus, a peace that passes all understanding. Father, I pray that as Scripture says, you are the lifter of our head. And no matter what it is that we're going through, I pray that you'll not only lift our head, but you will lift our spirits as you're filling us full of your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you will minister to us in such an incredible way. An incredible way. Father, we love you. Now, as I end this service, we pray for peace, we pray for favor, and we pray for blessings in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray, pray that as we leave this place today, that what we've learned can just penetrate down deep inside, that we know who you are. You're our shepherd who wants to take care of us. So as we leave, we pray for favor and blessings, put a smile on our face and a skip on our step, and we give you all the praise and the glory. As everybody says, amen, amen, amen. Hey, shake someone's head, hug someone, tell them you love them, invite them back next week. Love you guys. Have a good week in the name of Jesus.